All right, let's take a look at the neuromuscular system. So this is going to focus on the central nervous system, the peripheral nervous system, uh, the cranial nerves. There's actually 12 of those, but we just need to know four. Uh, muscular system, and then some neural regulation questions. Uh, okay, so here we have quite a few questions, actually. Um, and then we want this to be kind of like the lens through which we see this video. Right? And then we'll be kind of going back and forth looking at uh, these questions when they're being answered throughout the video. Um, so these questions, which part of the central nervous system controls breathing and blood pressure? Um, what is the fight or flight system? What is the thick filament found in sacromeres? What is its function? Um, sciatic nerves, what type of nerve is that? Um, the space between the terminal branch of a neuron and another neuron, do we know what that is? Uh, the lobe that relates to voluntary movement, there's four lobes that we'll go over, and a well-known demyelinating disorder. Um, we'll go over that as well. Okay. So as we start off with the central nervous system, right, we're just thinking that central nervous system is the brain, the spinal nerve, the spinal cord, and the associated nerves. All right, let's get going here. So the medulla, the cerebrum, and the cerebellum make up the central nervous system. And as we just said, the central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord. So the cerebrum is covered by a thick layer known as the cerebral cortex. The cerebrum controls speech, thought, memory, learning, and language. Uh, the cerebrum is responsible for higher level thinking. Okay, that's really the cerebrum. Uh, as we get into the four lobes, uh, the parietal lobe processes data related to movement, taste, temperature, and touch. The frontal lobe is related to voluntary movement. So I believe voluntary movement was one of our questions. Yeah, so if you get down to the sixth bullet point, which lobe relates to voluntary movement? Okay. Again, that was the frontal lobe, voluntary movement. The occipital lobe is responsible for vision. That's pretty easy to guess at. Uh, the temporal lobe is for comprehension, emotion, language, memory, and sensory input. So that's a lot. Okay, moving on, if we look at the medulla, the medulla controls autonomic and homeostatic functions such as breathing and blood pressure. I believe that was also a question. Exactly, first one, which part of this CNS controls breathing and blood pressure? Right? So that would be the medulla. And finally, the cerebellum regulates muscle coordination and balance. Okay, so you really got to be familiar with all these basic parts of the central nervous system. All right, as we move on, um, here's some more things. Uh, so the, for the spinal cord, it sends nerve impulses from the extremities of the body to the brain. Perhaps that's kind of obvious, but we want to be familiar with it. Uh, spinal nerves carry signals between the spinal column and the body. The sciatic nerve is an example of a spinal nerve that transmits signals to and from the leg and lower back. So you remember we mentioned <clears throat> uh, bullet point four here. The sciatic nerve is an example of what kind of nerve? Spinal nerve. The sciatic nerve transmits signals to and from where? And we just said from the leg and lower back, yeah? Okay. So if we look at uh, sensory neurons, they are nerve cells within the nervous system responsible for converting external stimuli from the organism's environment into internal electrical impulses. Uh, as an example, some sensory neurons respond to tactile stimuli and can activate motor neurons in order to achieve muscle contraction. Okay. And then let's look at motor neurons also. So a motor neuron is a neuron whose cell body is located in the spinal cord and whose fiber, which is axon, projects outside the spinal cord to directly or indirectly control effector organ, organs, mainly 
which is our muscles and glands. Okay. So I don't have any questions relating to those, but they are important concepts. All right, as we look at just the peripheral nervous system or the PNS and the central nervous system, we can see that within the peripheral nervous system is the somatic as well as the autonomic and then the related sympathetic and parasympathetic. So let's look at these. So the PNS includes all the nerves outside the CNS, the central nervous system, including nerves under conscious control, which are somatic, and nerves outside conscious control, which are autonomic, right? And that makes sense. Autonomic, you would think it means like, you know, it automatically happens. So the somatic nervous system sends and receives signals from skeletal muscle. Again, that means under conscious control. The autonomic nervous system regulates bodily processes that do not require conscious control. And this includes smooth and cardiac muscle activity. The smooth muscle is responsible for involuntary muscular contractions and is found in the walls of the visceral organs, such as the gastrointestinal tract. And the GI tract is a whole other <laughs> video in and of itself. Uh, smooth muscle can also be found in blood vessels, while cardiac muscle is also involuntary, but it only occurs in the heart. Okay, the sympathetic system right so we're gonna have the sympathetic and the parasympathetic right as you look at the bottom of that screen we have both that we're gonna look at the sympathetic system which is part of the autonomic nervous system is generally excitatory and involves fight or flight so that is one of our questions all right so that's point two Again, the questions here are like, you know, they're pretty straightforward. Which system is generally excitatory and involves fight or flight? Oops, too far. Um, so that would be the sympathetic system is fight or flight. While the parasympathetic system is the opposite. It has a calming effect such as decreased heart rate. The sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems again, just to repeat, make sure we got it, are each part of the autonomic nervous system, and that's the one that controls involuntary muscles. All right, let's move on. Uh, cranial nerves. Okay, so there's actually 12 sets of cranial nerves that reach the interior of the brain. Each of them have a specific function. So for our exam, though, we really just need to focus on these four. So let's briefly talk about each one. The olfactory nerve, that's a cranial nerve that coordinates sense of smell. The vagus nerve conveys signals from your abdominal organs and controls heart rate and digestion. The optic nerve transmits visual information from your eye to your brain and allows you to see. It's a pretty one, pretty easy one to guess at as far as optics are concerned. And spinal nerves transmit sensory and motor signals from the spinal cord to various areas of your body. Right, so perhaps the vagus nerve is the one that you have to actually uh, commit to memorization. Um, but those are the four that you need to be prepared for and that you could be tested on. Is there a question related to that? I don't think so. Okay, the muscular system. Uh, muscle fibers are composed of myofibrils and multiple muscle fiber bundles form a fascicle. Okay, so that's kind of what we start with. The skeletal muscle is made up of these fascicles, which are bundles of cells surrounded by connective tissue. There are sacromeres within each myofibril. Sacromeres are the unit of the muscle cell. Okay, so as far as we're looking at sacromeres, uh, there is both a thick and a thin filament found in sacromeres. The thin filament is actin, and the thick filament is myosin. Actin serves as the anchor point for myosin, which contracts and pulls actin closer together, shortening the sacromere during muscle contraction. Okay, so let's see with actin and myosin. I believe we have a question there. Let's look at it. Again, it's probably just a repeat of what I just said, but sometimes hearing it twice can be a little bit useful. It gets you to focus your mind on important parts of what I'm saying here. Uh, so what is the third bullet point? What is the thick filament found in sacromeres? What does it do? And so again, what we just said, right? 
was that the thin filament is actin, but the thick filament is myosin. So myosin was the point that we wanted on that one. Uh, the motor system controls voluntary muscles. The sensory system carries information from sensory receptors and nerve endings. And then finally, we have uh, neural regulation. Okay, uh, action potentials are messages that are communicated between the brain and the muscular system through electric signals. These action potentials travel along the axon. Myelin helps to increase the speed of the electrical impulse along the nerve cell. Um, and you might want to be familiar with multiple scler sclerosis, which is a demyelinating disorder. Uh, it prevents these impulses from being transferred effectively. So understanding the connection between multiple sclerosis and myelin is important, could easily show up as a question. Um, a synapse allows a neuron to send a chemical signal to another neuron. A synapse is a space between a terminal branch of a neuron and another neuron. So let's go back and we'll look at the synapses here for a question. For a second, I think that was a question. Yes. Uh, bullet point five, a space between a terminal branch of a neuron and another neuron is called a synapse. Okay, and then these last two here. A neurotransmitter is released at, at the synapse. So an example of a, neuro, of a neurotransmitter could be dopamine. Right? And we just need to know that's released at a synapse, with a synapse again being the space between a terminal branch of a neuron and another neuron. And then finally, uh, a buildup of lactic acid leads to muscle fatigue. Lactic acid decreases the pH in the muscle fibers, and a lower pH interferes with calcium binding and muscle contraction. All right. And then we can go back to our questions again, right? So we have a total of seven of them, right? So we went back to each of these, right? And then seeing if you can answer these for yourself. So this is an important part of active as opposed to passive learning. Passive learning would be you just watch the video and said, yep, makes sense. I got it, right? If you do have it, then answering these questions should be no problem. And that will help you to perform much better on the exam.